So we're recording now and I'm going to start letting people in. I normally give it about 30 seconds to a minute for everyone to come in um, and then we get going. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us once again. A lot of familiar faces popping up there. How are you doing, Bob? Um, and uh, so absolutely delighted to be joined tonight by, by James um, from Kilcoman to go through uh, a range of the whiskey. Kilcoman is, is one of my favorite distilleries since we expanded our collection of it in the bar there a couple of years back. Uh, the Sanig is possibly one of my top 10 smoky whiskeys at the moment. So um, in the entire world. So there you go. <laughs> um, so I've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, I think most people have have joined there. Um, so without further ado, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Luke Crawley Holland. I'm the uh, bar manager down in the Celtic Whiskey Bar in Lard and Irish Whiskey Experience in, in Clarny. We're the world's largest collection of Irish whiskey. And um, uh, so, yeah, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with the bar. If not, should drop me a line. Um, in the meantime, I'll pass you over to James. It's who, who you came here, not me. Good evening, everyone. Um, nice to meet you or see you all staring down at your, your screens there anyway. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, we've got four whiskeys to taste. And um, the more questions, the more, um, you know, interaction, the better uh, with these things. So I think um, maybe the easiest thing, Luke, is if, Normally handle them. Sorry, I didn't catch that. James, you kind of uh, froze for a second. Sorry. Sorry. Um, the, the questions, should they go in the chat? Or yeah, do people if everyone just wants, to, wants to, as we go, guys, as, as for those of you who've been on these, these chats before, tastings before, you want to keep your questions coming in the chat and um, also tasting notes. We love to hear tasting notes as we start tasting the whiskeys. Um, anything interesting you're getting, uh, don't be afraid to, to fire it in there. Um, so do you want to tell us a, a bit about yourself, James, and then maybe we, we can start in the first whiskey and we'll, we'll get into, into, into deep dive into, into what Kilcoman is all about. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I'm James, I'm, um, my father, Anthony is, is the founder, managing director of, of Kilhoman. Um, he built the distillery in 2005. And we, well, we, my family, we own and operate Kilhoman Distillery. And I'm, I'm based in Edinburgh with my brother and uh, my family are over on, on Isla. Um, so it's very much a family affair. Okay. And um, before I whittle on too much, I'll tell you a bit about the first whiskey. So I think, I believe everyone's got the tasting packs or it has the whiskey in front of them is that the case yeah we should have everyone should have these uh hopefully um these little vials uh with the label on them there james see. Um, perfect. all right so so the first one we're going to taste uh is called maca bay and if you get this in the glass and have a nose then you should get a pretty good feel for for the style of whiskey that we produce um we're based uh, we're, we were the eighth distillery to be, to be built on the island when my father built Kilhoman in 2005. And uh, we were the first new distillery for 125 years. Um, so the whole kind of concept behind the distillery is, is the fact that we're a farm and we produce some of our whiskey from barley that we grow. Um, three of this evening's whiskeys are made from barley that we buy in and Maca Bay is one of them. The 100% the Isla is the one whiskey which is, is made from the barley that we buy, uh, sorry, that we grow. Um, so Maca Bay is, is kind of our, our core expression. This is produced from a heavily peated malt that we purchased from the Port Allen Maltings. It's, it's 50 ppm peating level. And um, the whole kind of Kilhoman style is about combining kind of light citrus floral character. So with, with all of our range, you'll find the peat smoke there, but more often than not, that's complemented with a lighter, fruitier character. With Maca Bay, you know, you'll certainly get that maritime smoky character on the nose, but behind that, there's quite a lot of floral citrus character as well. 
No, you get it. You get some really extraordinary um, complexities in there. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I, I love the brand so much. That that maritime um, flavors is a really good, uh, really good tasting, a really good word to kind of um, visualize what 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 is going on in there. Um, it's it's really really interesting. Um, maybe tell us more about your about the distillation process and how how we, we're getting that flavor from the spirit. So I mean, well, in terms of Firstly, I guess the dominating factors with Maccabe are, are really the, the cast combinations. So for this, we're using 90% bourbon cast maturation and then 10% maturation. But as I say, with, with the kind of classic style of Gilhome, we're looking for that combination of, of peat smoke, citrus, floral character as well. So heavily peated malted barley. We have very small stills. We have a very long fermentation time. I can go into these details a bit more as we go through the tasting, but essentially, you know, the still house, the, the malting, the mash, um, the distillation is all about bringing out the lighter floral side to the whiskey that can then be complemented, you know, offset the, the earthy maritime influence of the peat smoke. And then we're using bourbon barrels to add some caramel, some vanilla. You know, this is 90% matured in bourbon barrels. And then we use just a little bit of, of sherry cast maturation. It's about 10% sherry cast maturation to add a little bit of richness, a little bit of peppery spice on the back of the palate. Mm. Well, you definitely, definitely get that peppery spice in the back of the palate. We have a fantastic question from Alan already saying, sounds very similar to the Irish language, James. What does Coman in, in Kilcoman stand for? Is it church of something? So obviously Kil in Irish is church. Um, so like Killarney, where our whiskey bar is based, is church of the slows. Um, so what, what does the Coleman side stand for? Well, the kill is correct. And I got this question for the first time, um, the last night and I still haven't looked it up. Uh, Coleman, he's a, he's a paint, he's a saint of something. I actually don't know what, um, so that we, the distillery is, is within the parish of Kilhoman. And, um, that was sort of the natural kind of place that we got to in terms of naming the distillery. Um, but believe it or not, I, after 15 years, I still haven't found or, or looked up exactly what, you know, Komen did for, uh, did for the area. Oh, that's interesting. Cause, um, yeah, I know that the down here, I know that in Ireland, there's a lot of places don't know the, why the, the, whatever follows the kill comes about. There's a few places down where I am. There's one place called Cologne. Um, and they reckon it was just a hermit called a very religious hermit called, Owen lived there and uh and his he you know record of him has passed um away from the place of the earth probably you know fifteen hundred years ago, but what's left is the is the place name. I wonder is it similar with Coleman? Maybe or maybe someone at home knows, maybe someone in the chat can know. Um Norris is this that would actually, be very convenient for me. Sorry? I say that would that'd be convenient for me not knowing um, <laughs> if, if that were the case. No, it, it certainly would. Um, Norris is lovely, light, brit, uh, lovely, bright citrus smoke. Um, it's a great description. Well, tell us about the ages involved here and the age statements. Obviously, it's, it's a non-age statement whiskey, but what ages are we looking at inside inside the, the bottle? This is, uh, it, it averages out at about five years old. Um, we're using, you know, pretty young spirit. Um, and we have done, you know, we've uh, been releasing whiskey ever since we could, you know, um, since it was three years old. And, um, you know, it's, it's always been well received. In my opinion, it's always been fantastic quality. I think if you distill in the right way and you, you invest in doing that, that distillation and fermentation processes, you know, you can, as well as, you know, good quality barrels, you can have a fantastic young whiskey. And even more so, in my opinion, when you have a, a heavy cause, that peat smoke adds a lot of depth to the whiskey um, at a young age. And a lot of the time people who are, who enjoy peated whiskey, enjoy that, you know, younger, more kind of powerful peat smoke that you'll get when it is, as I say, slightly younger. So, um, so yeah, relatively young. But for me, that really only in some way makes it more unique because it's clean and it's vibrant. You know, it's not a young, raw, aggressive style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, I love the the sweetness in there as well. It's not a as 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 we you've mentioned and it's been mentioned in the chat. You know, it's that it's not the charcoaly oiliness that you get from some Isla Isla peated whiskies. You know, it's 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 very citrus, very floral, 
um you know dances around in the back of the palette there really interesting that kind of white pepperiness there um no it's 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 a it's a fantastic introduction to the to the to the tasting <laughs> if they continues this good which i know definitely uh two of them are so um we should be in for a good night yeah and this this is non-chill filtered it's, it's relatively light you know color um the barrels we're using are, are coming from buffalo trace distillery um we have a policy where we we always ship them whole and wet um we only fill uh new casks or new bourbon barrels from from buffalo trace um, which gives us a lot of consistency and and really you know when you and as i say in, you know invest in in elements like the barrels and the detail of it you know the fact that they come whole that they're wet and and you know the fact that we are filling them most of the time within six or eight weeks of them being emptied in kentucky again that really means that the character of the whiskey comes on that much quicker than maybe using a, a refill cask or mm. or you know maybe taking a more in some ways I'd, i would say like traditional approach because the traditions of scotch whiskey is is producing whiskey for blending and a lot of those traditions are have been dressed up in different ways but a lot of it's about efficiency and producing a a liquid at a certain price point. Whereas for Kilhoman, we are only producing single malt. We don't sell any whiskey for blending or independent bottling. So all of our whiskey, we're, we're happy to, to go through um, processes that are maybe less efficient or maybe higher in cost because we, we feel that that will pay back in terms of the quality of the whiskey mm -hmm. and the barrels as well. Definitely. And, it, and it's, it doesn't show in the cost. I mean, this is available for 51 euros. So, I mean, it's not a... It's hardly extortionist <laughs> for a whiskey of of this quality. Tell maybe how how did that relationship come about with with Buffalo Trace? Um, I mean that sounds quite unique for especially for uh, a young enough brand like yourselves. Maybe uh, unless that's too much peeking behind the curtain. <laughs> no, no, no. We have we have no secrets at all. Um, the uh, the relationship kind of came about um, through um, a consultant really. So we work very closely with a a guy called Jim Swan who is um, very well known within the, the Scotch guy behind a lot of the, the more successful new brands, um, as well as the like, like Cavalan, uh, you know, Kilhoman, Wolfburn, all sorts of new distilleries that are coming through in Ireland, in, in Scotland. And um, he made the introduction and we asked the question if we could buy direct and it's, it's, uh, it's been plain sailing ever since, you know, I don't think, People, it doesn't suit a lot of distilleries because firstly, the, there's a lot more uh, management to it. There's a lot long, longer term commitment. The prices are higher. There's more logistic challenges, um, but it really pays back in terms of the whiskey. Um, we're only filling around about between, well, it depends on the year. We've, we've increased every year, but a maximum of about 2000 casts a year. So we have a, a container load arriving every sort of three, four weeks. And, um, and that suits us quite well, you know, that sort of rhythm. Whereas bigger distilleries that are filling, you know, there are plenty of distilleries on Isla that are filling four, five, you know, 50 times as many barrels as us. And they, they simply can't handle that logistic, you know, the logistics sort of mm. side of that, you know, they need to come over in huge bulk and be flat packed on the pay over and everything else. So mm. it doesn't suit a lot of distilleries, but it, it suits us very well. Oh, fantastic. I have a question in the chat about the PPM. Did you um, mention 50, was it, or? Yeah, so this, the Machabe, San Egg, and, and the Fino that we're going to try, those are all 50 PPM malted barley that we buy from the Portella maltings on Isla. So we're not malting this ourselves. The barley is, is grown on the mainland of Scotland. And, uh, I mean, PPM, we quote 50 PPM. The reality is that there'll be some degree of, of change around that, uh, but it it's around about fifty ppm, heavily peated, essentially. Oh, no, very good. No, that that's uh, uh, that's obviously much more peated than a lot of the Irish uh, peat that you get. But um, I suppose a lot of the the Isla would be in in and around that range. I imagine it's similar to an Ardbeg Lafroig. Yeah, so so it's um, it's the same peating level as Ardbeg. Hmm. So we buy the because we're not big enough to kind of have our own specification mm -hmm. purchasing from Port Island Maltings we had to kind of piggyback on on someone else's specification so this is the same as our bag mm. but actually 
even though I would say our whiskey is is less smoky, you know, less iodine, you know, maritime mm -hmm. influence than Lafroig and Lagavulin, the peating level is higher. You know, they they're buying uh, sort of around, around thirty to forty ppm. Mm. So our, our malted barley, our raw ingredient is is more smoky, but the processes we go through are, as I say, geared towards bringing out the the lighter side of the whiskey rather than emphasising that that heavy smoke. Mm. And I think that definitely shows in the character. That's it's extraordinary because we had um, Abigail from from Brooklady on last week. Uh, we're going through an Octomore range and. Even though obviously the Octomores are, are a huge uh, PPM, they don't, you know, there's, there is, we even mentioned it in the chat and she mentioned it, that some of the yard bags come across on the, on the nose and the palate as, as even more smoky, even though it might be 100 less PPM, do you know? Um, so it's really interesting that this would be higher and obviously you have this from the same source, but it's definitely less in your face as, as, as some other island malt is. But, it, but I, I mean that in a good way. Um, yeah, I mean, my father always was, was going for a, you know, because the, the great thing about Tillery is that you can kind of go into it um, with a degree of, of kind of um, preemption or, or I don't know the word, but he went into it saying, right, well, I want a style of whiskey that is peaty, but is maybe lighter than the, the Lafroy, Lagavulin, Ardbeg kind of style, but, but more heavily, more distinctively PT than maybe the Bunahar kind of classic Brooklady style, mm. you know. So I think we kind of sit very nicely in the sort of bridging the gap between the really heavy islers and the and the slightly more light islers, you know. So we kind of put ourselves in the middle there, and and I I feel that's not that's not me sort of making up a position. I think I generally feel that we we sit very nicely in the middle there where we have the smoke, but also that real citrus sweetness, the freshness, the vibrancy. Mm -hmm. No, no, I think I think that's that's definitely. I think the whiskey speaks for itself, in, in that regards, um, no, certainly. Uh, Tom Cotter in the the chat has asked: Is, is has any COVID uh, in, impacted with any logistics around barrels? Um, no, no, it hasn't. To be honest, um, we we have a we have a fixed kind of contract. We have to sign it, you know, twelve months in advance. For you know, we we are obliged to take delivery of them. And they're still emptying barrels in Kentucky, so so they're still ar arriving at at, um, at Kilhoman. Um, and because we, even though, well, we, we're distilling ourselves, we're maturing, we we kind of have complete control, well, much more control than a lot of other distilleries. Um, mm -hmm. And even though it was me, my dad, and two other guys on the bottling line during the full lockdown in in the UK, um, we still managed to get all our all of our orders out, and um, and it, we haven't really had big issues at all. And if anything, we've seen a real surge in demand for for our whiskies during that time. So um, well, that's that's so amazing. Um, yeah. That you would have seen haven't seen an increase because we had we had the same thing. We had a, a, um, Aaron on with Aaron tasting recently, and we had, as I mentioned, Abigail from Brooklady, and both of them said that their demand has increased during. COVID so obviously people are sinking bottles of whiskey at home <laughs> yeah I, I don't know what you can put it down to I mean I think maybe it's it's sort of um, the fact that people maybe aren't traveling so much and and you know travel retail is such a huge part of the whiskey industry in some ways and also the kind of at home you know they're exploring their passion maybe a bit more so all sorts of different things perhaps but yeah certainly we've we've seen a huge surge um you know, Sané, for example, the next whiskey we're going to try, this, we've seen a growth of that of about 60-70% over the year. Wow. Well, I mean, I think actually maybe it might be a good time um, to come on to the, to the next one, uh, to, to the Sané. Um, I don't know if you recommend um, maybe even keeping a bit of the the uh, <laughs> brain fart moment there. Um, <laughs> yeah. The Mac rear to... Um, to taste um or even compare color with i know i've got a spare glass here so you might do that yeah. um, i mean I the color straight away is what I would advise is is going through all the whiskies tasting them probably I, I probably wouldn't even add any water at this point taste them all leave a bit i don't know how how generous you guys were with your samples but hopefully leave a little <laughs> bit in in the bottom and um and you can kind of go back and compare because your, your palate will change as you go through and also <laughs> you can kind of, it, it crystallizes the characters within each whiskey when you taste different ones. So, so yeah, leave a bit if you can. No, definitely. That's a good, that's a good. And, uh, 
and Sanig. So immediately you'll see um, mm. there's a huge difference in, in color between these, these two whiskeys. Um, Maccabay and Sané, th these are names of, of locations near the distillery. They're both kind of beaches, headlands near the distillery. And um, these are our core range products. So these are the only whiskeys in our range which are always available. Everything else we, we release is, is either in a, a batch which kind of comes around every year or it's a, it's a one-off special edition. So Sané is, is kind of like the sister whiskey of, of Maccabay. They're both 46%. Um, they're both a combination of bourbon and, and sherry casks. Um, they're both produced from the same spirit, you know, this boat, same 50 ppm malted barley distilled in the same way. However, Sanig is, is about 70% Oloroso sherry cask matured um, compared to the 90% bourbon cask matured Macabay. So mostly sherry cask matured. Hence the, the very, very dark color. And this just creates a completely different whiskey. Um, soft, fruity, rounded. Um, you're not getting, you're still getting a, a little bit of that maritime influence, but really the, the kind of thing, unique thing to this, this whiskey is that cooked fruits, um, rich dried fruits, a little bit of sort of cinnamon, festive kind of spices. That's really what, what sets this apart. Mm. Great tasting note from Rob Donner, which says, Christ, I like that Sanic. I totally agree. As I mentioned at the start, one of my favorites. Um, no, it's, it's, it's hints of tequila. That's an interesting taste. note. I don't know if that's a, a first there, James. Um, maybe a little bit like, um, there's a bit of chili sort of spice to it, mm. maybe. Oh, 100%, yeah. I do, th I do like, it's almost like um, candied some fruits and then kind of smoked them for a bit. Like, you know, it's, it's got that, that almost like smoked caramel uh, that kind of grips the back of your tongue. Um, and it's just, it's, it's yeah. just small hinted of tannins in, in there as well. That kind of, you want to get that gripping in the mouth as well. No, it's a, it's a really good, um, really, really good whiskey. So you've told us about the, the provenance of the, of the Buffalo trace of your bourbon barrels. What about these, uh, these sherry casks, the Oloroso casks? So these, uh, these come from a uh, producer called uh, Miguel Martin. Um, he uh, is um, a, you know, he, he's a sherry producer, but he's almost as much about sh casks in terms of selling casks to whiskey producers as he is about his, his sherry. Um, Probably makes more money. We, yeah, well, it's, it's straight, <laughs> he's the fourth, I think he's the fourth generation to, in his family to be, um, to be producing sherry. And he's the first of those generations to make more money from selling the barrels and selling the the sherry it's a bit it's a bit of a sad situation but no it is um, sad, especially for for you know I'm, i personally not being facetious i i, I love a, a sherry a good fortified wine um i think it's it's yeah. it's and it's a huge part of both here and in the uk our drinking history and culture but ones that most people are, are very ignorant of like you know um so yeah. i think it is it, it is a shame that a lot of these port and sherry producers make more money off the casks but unfortunately that's the economy we're living in yeah. And for, for Sané, so we buy, well, we buy a couple of different sherry types, um, both, you know, in terms of like Pedro Jimenez, Oloroso, um, Fino, um, and, but mainly, mainly we're buying Oloroso sherry casks from him. And we buy two types of Oloroso casks, um, hogsheads and butts. Um, we use the hogsheads for Sané and we use the larger um, Oloroso butts for, for Loch Gorm, which is a slightly longer maturation. So where you say that there's a bit of tannin kind of coming through with, with Sanig, that's really coming from these hogsheads, which are newer oak, American oak, um, and typically haven't been used to mature Oloroso for as long. Mm. So you're getting a combination of kind of almost Oloroso characteristics in terms of the, the cooked fruits, the dried fruits, but then also kind of some of that cinnamon oaky sweetness tannin is is really that extract from from the oak that you you wouldn't necessarily associate with a, a classic sherry maturation but works really really well with with sane because well for a large part because of the, the age you know this is a relatively young whiskey so you want a very very active cask and you can you know again going back to the color mm. you know, stunning color for, for a relatively young whiskey 
No, it isn't. And it's just, it's, it's nicely rounded, you know. It's still Kilhoman style in that the peat smoke's there, but it's light, it's kind of rumbling in the background. But this is rounded, it's fruity, as I say, um, and it, it's a very nice kind of sister, if you like. I always describe it as a sister whiskey to, to Maki Bay. There's, there's a similarity, but the two are very, very distinctly different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, certainly. And, and everyone at home, we'd love to hear your thoughts in the chat. It seems to be getting great feedback so far. Um, Eamon says it's a lovely balance between the sherry influence and the peat. Um, I think that, oh, that's uh, definitely um smells like lagavulin like 18 but much softer in the palate smells like an 18 year old whiskey that's high praise for for a young whiskey that's that. that's, that's something um yeah mm. no i mean it, it it's the 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 whiskey does genuinely taste beyond its years and and it there are a couple of processes which we do slightly differently um one of them is fermentation times so we have a, a relatively long fermentation time it's up at about um, averages about 90 to 100 hours approximately and that really helps build out the kind of citrus side of the whiskey and um and then our, our stills i don't know if anyone's been to kilhoman but the stills are very small um and that means that we have a, a huge amount of copper contact the stills are i don't know if you, i don't want to get too technical but our spirit stills just over 2,000 liters you know so tiny tiny still but only about twice twice the height of me in, in, in total. So it's um, very small stills, much higher copper contact, which means you're producing a really, really clean spirit. And then, you know, during our distillation, we're only taking a very, very uh, short cut, you know, five minutes on four shot, and then we're only collecting down to 65.5%. To so very high cut means we've got a lot of clean, um, fresh alcohol that doesn't need a lot of, maturation to kind of come on you know so with Maccabay Sane we're using very very fresh casks so within that five six seven year period you've got something that's that's grounded in the peat smoke and the citrus but being added to by the the caramel vanilla of the bourbon barrel or the or the rich fruity character of the sherry cask mm. no that's fantastic and um, you we've got a question there in the chat about what ABV is a cask that so we we fill at 63.5%. Uh, mm. Yeah, so fairly fairly standard filling strength. Mm. There have and been occasions yeah. where I've been in charge. So back in like the early days of Kilhoman, I mean, uh, I was like, what was I? During like university holidays and stuff like that, um, I'd be in the warehouse filling casts and things. And we had, a, we had a stillman. Well, back in the early days, we had one stillman. So when he went on holiday, it was like me and my dad or my brothers stilling and filling casts and stuff. <laughs> and we weren't very, weren't very experienced. And so there are a batch of casts that were filled at sort of 68%. And, and that was me with my formula on a, on a fag packet, just getting, <laughs> getting it completely wrong. So we have, we have filled at higher strengths, but, but 63.5 uh, is, is our standard and it works well for us. And have you any plans of what you're going to do with those, those ones that were filled at 68%? Are they going to be special single cask releases or anything? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see how they turn out. We have bottled some of them as as single casts um but you know just because they're filled at higher strength doesn't make them any better you know no but maybe it lets i know that um for a while um there was lots of single casks here from from older irish distilleries that caden heads were buying casks from bow street which is obviously where jameson used to be produced and they were all they used to at the time i don't know if it was a caden head policy or was it just with irish whiskey but they were they were filling everything as they were not reducing anything after it came off the still. It was all filled casks at, at, the, at the still, I suppose, at still strength and as opposed to whatever it could bring cast at. Um, so you've got, you, you still even now, there's like 30 year old bottles of it. They're like unicorns and Irish whiskey of these old, just old things, but the ABV is huge on it. It's like 82% or something, like even now. Um, it's really interesting. No, I mean, that is, that is one advantage of, of filling at higher strength for sure. Uh, you know, that longer term maturation you don't have something that's way down in the in the 40s you know you've got something that's still got got some punch behind it so yeah no absolutely um ian asks are all the casks aged in isla yeah so we have um everything everything's matured pretty much at the distillery um we have around about 10 or eleven thousand casks in the warehouses at the moment we have traditional dunnage warehouses so even though they're, they're, they're new Dunnage warehouses, which you don't see very often, um, 
more people most people these days have have more sense than to build dunnage warehouses <laughs> such a pain in the ass um if you're, if you're not familiar with dunnage warehousing basically it's it's very very traditional way of of storing casks where you have an earth floor in the warehouse um casks lie on their sides three high basically stacked on each other um and uh, my father is a, is a big believer in in dunnage warehousing um he believes it's a much slower steadier more consistent maturation uh so he is completely committed to that even though the rest of us um spend most of our time in the warehouses effing and blinding about him and his effing dunnage warehouses because if you have a if you, you can imagine a, a row of of 30 barrels so we go from the middle of the warehouse to the to the side of the warehouse it's 30 barrels on their side so you've got 30 barrels on the floor you've got 30 barrels above that and then 30 barrels above that so mm. to get to that bottom barrel at the back you have to take off what is that uh, 89 barrels to get by hand to get to that one at the back um, so <laughs> it, it means that you know uh if you you know you know if you're it would take one guy in a forklift 10 minutes to store 50 casks but for us it'll take three guys an hour probably at best two or three hours maybe to, to store those 50 casks um and this is where I like this whole thing about investing in the whiskey, you know, but we, we do this not because it's, it's cheaper or because it's easier. We do it because we, we feel it, it pays back in terms of the whiskey. So, um, so whilst we don't do it with a smile on our faces, you know, we, we might have a smile on our faces in 10 years time when we, when we taste the whiskey. And why, 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 um, why does he think the Dunge makes such a difference? What's the, what scientifically is happening there? I think well, basically you have you have very different um, microclimates within the warehouse. Much much damper, much more stable temperature, top to bottom uh, in particular. So, in a, the alternatives are basically um, racked warehouses mm -hmm. where you have a, a concrete floor. Well, in all the other alternatives, you have a concrete floor, which immediately makes it a much drier um, and more changeable, or more subject to change in terms of the, the climate within the warehouse. Um, so, um, concrete floors, racked warehouses, you know, the barrels are on their sides, but they go right up to the top where there's a big temperature difference between the, the bottom and the, and the top in terms of, you know, but firstly temperature, but also humidity. And then also when you have a, a palletized warehouse where the barrels are on their ends, um, you have a, a similar situation, um, but also, um, those barrels can deteriorate. And you can you can get you know the dry, the tops dry out, um, and yeah, I mean it, it. Essentially, we've we've always done it. It's worked very well for us. Um, and people that we've spoken to within the industry who maybe have a mix of dunnage and and palletized and racked warehouses, they they genuinely will tell us that the whiskey maturing in their in their dunnage warehousing tends to be a more consistent, higher quality. Mm -hmm. No, it's interesting. I suppose that now would be a good time to ask. There's a question I've asked everyone um, who's come on here, but we, well, how, in terms of distance from the equator and where you're based, do you think that makes a, a, a big difference? Is it where we are down in the Southwest, there's a couple of distilleries down here who, who say it does, that the closest, because they're further South, they reckon they're getting more bang for their buck in terms of maturation time than ones even in Northern Ireland. Um, do you think, I know that people, you know, the Orkney distilleries often are said to be, you know, have a, a you know age better over over the longer term than they're younger because of their geographical location. Do you think that that plays a difference? I mean, at all at all. And think, if so, does it play a difference in Kilcoman? I think maybe just purely saying it's it's distance from from the equator is, is maybe over oversimplifying mm -hmm. it. I think um, you know where you have islands, you know you you um, you always have a, a milder climate. You know, so there's very little change summer to winter. Mm -hmm. You know, as you, as you as that um, temperature change in particular from summer to winter, where you have a, a, a higher degree of change, you know, um, you're going to have a faster maturation um, because the, 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 the whiskey is being sucked right the way into the wood mm. and then being pushed right the way out. And you're having that, that quite extreme um, temperature change. I think, you know, for, for Isla, uh, for Kilhoman, you know, the temperature change summer to winter is 
it's very small you know very rarely freezes on isla um even in the in the depths of winter you know it's it's a warm wet climate um and that means the temperatures within our warehouses are very steady so yeah you could you could say that they get more bang for their buck but ultimately it, it just depends on on the cast that you've got and it comes down to to the distillery manager knowing and understanding the casks the climate and and the whiskey and and how those three come together you know because even if, if you have a if you have a bigger temperature change summer to winter maybe you're using you're using less fresh casks which reduces the the amount of extraction from the yolk you know so so it really comes down to to you know horses for courses kind of thing yeah, no, no, fair enough. That's a, that's a fantastic answer. Probably one of the better ones we've had. <laughs> um, definitely. Uh, right, excellent. Um, I suppose we could come on to the next whiskey now, um, or if people are still sipping away. I know I'm nearly finished with Sonic, but it always goes very down very fast in my hand. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, it, does, it is a whiskey that really slips down. I think the um, particularly like sherry matured car strength kill home in. Oof, you can get yourself in big trouble real quick. Yeah, no, oh, oh, definitely, definitely. Especially on a Wednesday night, you know. <laughs> um fantastic so which one do you want to come on to next is the fino or the 100 percent isla i was gonna originally i think i told you i was gonna taste the 100 percent, but actually mm. i think we should taste the fino so we'll, t we'll taste the fino next all right Perfect. so um machiavé san Agar are, are as i said the, the, the core expressions and then typically in a year we will have two um uh, releases that are annual releases so machiavé sorry Loch Gorm and 100% Isla, they come around every year. And then as well as that, we'll have two limited editions, which are our true sort of standalone limited editions that won't be repeated. And this year, um, we released a couple of, couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, uh, Fino Matured. So these are the only Fino casks that we had in our warehouse. Um, this is a vatting of, of 12 um, Fino casks. Um, it's a combination of, of 2014 and 2016 casks. So some are relatively young whiskey and some still relatively young whiskey. But um, <laughs> yeah, the combination of, sort of four, four and six year old whiskey today. Um, and this is, this is bottled at, I think it's 46, yeah. Yeah, so this is bottled at 46%. And, you know, Fino is a, is a drier, more sort of saline, saline is a terrible descriptive word for, for something that's meant to be full of flavor but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a drier uh, style of sherry so you, you're getting a completely different character flavor profile to the the oloroso sherry in the san Egg, you know you, mm -hmm. yeah, you get that dryness immediately on the nose you know no, that, it's, it's incredible the, on the nose yeah that dry immediately you if you're familiar with with kind of drier sherries you know straight away you get that on the nose mm. um Still a bit of peat smoke, still a bit of saltiness, and that's maybe accentuated by the by the fino. There's almost a bit of grassiness there or something. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And then on the palate, you know, you, you again have that that sort of slightly dry, salty character coming through, but the peat smoke comes through as well. And um, yeah, completely different animal to the to the Oloroso. Um, and this is kind of because we're so sort of young in the in the history of or the history of Kilhoman is so short. We're still really experimenting, feeling our way with these with these cast types that aren't so common, mm. you know. So so this is the first time we've we've bottled Fino matured Kilhoman, and um, I think it works nicely. I think it's maybe it's, it's more on the sort of subtle side in in some ways. It's not like a big sherry cast that's coming in and, and hitting you with a huge amount of flavour. It's not port it's not um you know any any number of of sweet or dry or or rich wine you know cast maturation it's, it's a bit more subtle but uh, this is one that kind of develops on the palate a bit you know it's, it's got that subtlety to it which which kind of draws you in mm. i think it's quite juicy <laughs> um almost even though the the the, the, the palate the flavors don't don't necessarily immediately link to that but there's there is something that kind of with the way it, it almost acidically gets the gums going it's like yeah um no it's gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> mm. that's the first time i've heard that but actually immediately when you said that it was uh, it really rang true so no it's it's um it, it shows off just a very slightly different side and and with all of these whiskeys you know we're tasting kind of five six 
seven-year-old whiskies here. All the same spirit at day one, but just subtle differences in cast type um, contributes a huge, huge difference in flavor. So it really just shows how important the casts are. And I'm, and I'm sure, you know, judging by the questions that are coming in, people are very aware of how important the cask is. No, definitely. And there's some great comments there. Nora says dry, and, dry salt and light oil. That's, that's definitely true. Briny, yeah, not 100%. Lots of toffee. Um, yeah. I don't know if I personally get that, but I get hints of it. It's there, definitely. Um, dates, yeah. Uh, lingering anise in the throat. Yeah, no, I definitely get that that kind of um, finish. Well, for me, there's a lot of oily carrots coming through. Mm. And with, with Go Home and in general, you and particularly with sherry cask maturation, um, you have that real kind of viscous, oily, um, sometimes very creamy side to, to Go Home and no definitely definitely um i think in terms of in terms of that mouthfeel um i don't know if it's mouthfeel if it's actually literal texture or if it's just uh what's going on there it definitely seems the more um the more intense of the ones we've tasted so far you know um we would have, we would have loved to bottle this i was um well i should say kill him is not a it's not a democracy it's very much a dictatorship <laughs> and, um, so i was i was like pressing my dad to, to bottle this at, at car strength or or at least something a little bit higher because I feel it just needs like a couple of ABV higher just to really push it through on the palate. But um, he decided to ignore me as he does <laughs> most of the time. And, um, and we bought it at 46. We didn't have that many, um, that many casts, you know, so 12, only 12 casts in total. Um, mm. Those were, those were butts. So we ended up with about 10 and a half thousand bottles and uh yeah, it, it's it's a very pleasant, very very nice style of home. And so we will we will one hundred percent repeat this. Uh, but as I said, those were the only casts we had in the warehouse, so we'll be waiting a, a couple of years before before we see that again. That's a shame. Yeah. Um, no, it's 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 really good. I mean, you do see those kind of drier sherry styles coming in um, at the moment more so than you did a few years ago. On top of Maury, got the Manthania cask is a um, distillery here. Uh, that's bottled two or three different uh, Paolo Cataldo casks. Um, and we did a, a dingle tasting last month, which was for Celtic Whiskey, our own casks that we've maturing, that that these are these were cast samples from the Dingle Distillery that will one day join our, our independent single bottling range. And there was a, a Fino and a Mantelado and a Paolo Cataldo in them. Um, but the way the way the, the complexity is this and, and how drastically different it is to the other two for such for, as you mentioned, the whiskies of that age, the fact that the the cask uh, you know profile comes out so much and that you're not thinking you know you with, with a lot of other whiskies even much older than this you get you're like oh that's that familiar toffee from their spirit and then you have the the cask flavors that are more discernible this these these seem so much more complex you know you wouldn't even the blind tasting you wouldn't necessarily tell the I, I personally anyway wouldn't be able to tell that they all came off the same stills you know exactly like you know um which i think is really impressive um of of how, how, what you're doing there um, in Kilcoman. My, my dad's a big fan of, of full maturation in terms of like alternative cast types. So he, he'd much prefer to fill Fino casts with new spirit mm. with, you know, fills to turn casts with, well, to turn one that doesn't really work that well, but port casts or, or tequila casts, mezcal casts um, that we've filled recently. He'd, he'd much rather fill these casts with new make and get the full hit of that, that character, that influence. Whereas, you know, a lot of the distilleries are tempted to just use them as finishing casts mm -hmm. where, you, you know, so, sometimes it works better, you know, and Saturn is actually one where we found it works better as a finishing cast. But most of the time we find a, a full maturation in Fino, in Port, in, in, you know, you know, whatever it is, whatever cast type, you know, the Kilhoman spirit firstly can, can stand up to it over a reasonable maturation, uh, but also... The customers are, are just much more engaged with it because you're getting you put pheno on the label and then you you bring it up to your nose and you go right well that i'm getting that pheno influence you know mm. so um i think it's a good a good move to, to really look slightly more long term with with the maturation of these cast types and definitely for 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 um i find in my experience the whiskey drinkers i mean people who are getting into whiskey particularly in ireland where it's going through a, a, an unprecedented boom in the last 10 years and people are really embracing it and they're 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 very knowledgeable consumers and they know their stuff and when you know the 
when you've just quickly seasoned a, a sherry cask and then finished it, I'm not saying you personally, I mean, in general, people in the industry, um, people can tell that, you know, they, they, they know when they're being had in that regard. Like, you know, I don't mean that they necessarily produce a bad whiskey, but um, it's like with anything, when you buy new shoes or something, you know, if you can see that, that, that better craftsmanship or those tiny little um, stitchings on, on some st side, which is, you know, when you go that extra mile with these casks, it, it really does come through, you know, and I think the consumer will reward us with that, you know, and particularly when it comes to these styles of, of fortified wines and people who, who are on the, the Zoom call who've been on these before will know that, that I always mention we've got a huge um, fortified wine menu in the bar, probably about 35 different sherries, both uh, and ports and Madeiras, both dry and sweet. And uh, when new people start and they're, they want to, you know, everyone young in the industry, whether they work in an off license or a bar or for a, 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 a distillery, they want to call themselves whiskey specialists and get into the role. Um, but what I always say is you have to start with understanding these wines first, you know, not necessarily first, but you know, you'll never really be able to, to, to talk and understand whiskey until you understand what a fino is, you know, until you know what a fino tastes like in its own, in its own right, which maybe is a bit snobby, but it's genuinely, you know, how I think, cause I think these are fantastic wines as well. And I think it's, it's a real testament to what you've produced here. Um, that, 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 that all that really comes together. I think it's, it's a real quality. So I don't know, that's not really a question, but that's in my opinion. No, 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 I, I, I agree completely because you can, otherwise you don't know where, I, I enjoy whiskey the most where I can identify where the flavors came from. Mm -hmm. you know, that's quite a lot of the time why I enjoy drinking single cask whiskey so much, because I feel like I can drink that whiskey and I know I kind of have all the information in front of me and I can say, okay, well, well, I know that that flavors come from that. Oloroso cask or that PX cask or whatever it is and I know that that flavor must have been something to do with their distillation and, and it, it, it kind of crystallizes it all in my head so I think the, the more people know about the whiskey the more they're going to enjoy it because they can associate with the flavors that they're tasting in their glass so we're, we, we're a complete open book I mean, you know you can ask or you can come and you can you can see um, and, and we're, we'll, we'll give you the answer that, that we have you know we, we won't dress it up Mm. no that's fantastic we'd love to hear what you guys think in, in the chat as well um please do do keep the points coming we do uh i'm just going back to that that what you just mentioned there james we we one of our we we're the irish whiskey experience as well down in clarny where we it's not as quite as fancy as the scotch whiskey experience we don't have a, a barrel ride it's more of a uh, you sit down and you you go through the history and the brand it's very personal um but it's uh but one of the classes we do um is uh fortified wine and whiskey tasting casks and class and we take a, a brand of a famous brand of irish whiskey um it's actually tear common we use for anyone who's watching it's not a secret and uh they have a 10 year old range that all of different cask finishes so they it's explicitly our finishes um so we try their bourbon cask then we try their port the madeira and and the sherry with a uh, port a madeira and an oloroso and uh, you know I've, I've never heard have someone come away from that class and not be just like more enthused about the art of, of whiskey production, even if people who, because you always get in the nature of the business, you always get people in who, who you know, maybe a partner is more interested in the whiskey than they are. And then, but then they, they you know, when, you, when you're able to pick flavors out from one thing and then the other thing, it's, uh, you know, it's people get really excited about, about you know, it brings them closer to the art, you know, um, and to what, what, what people like yourself and your dad and, and, and you guys at Kilcoman are trying to achieve, like when you, when you cast things in the first place, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, I think um, works very well. Works very well, and I, c I can't pretend to be a, an expert on on uh, anything other than Kilhonan, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you guys behind the bars that have access to this huge range of of um, of spirits and and fortified wines, stuff. You're often better placed to kind of um, you know to place a product in the, in the range of of what's available. You know, so I always try and sort of stand back from that and, and let you guys kind of say where it sits in comparison to other brands, because I've only ever known Kilhoman, <laughs> you know, mm. first whiskey I ever tasted pretty much was, was new make off the still. And then it's, it's been Kilhoman from there. So, so uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's always nice to hear people's impressions of it. Yeah, no, I suppose that's the same. And, you know, when you're in any industry, if you're in the production side and you're involved in it, you know, I mean, even when you know, if I'm managing a bar, I, I, I rarely get out and spend time in other bars, you know, because, you know, Friday and Saturday night, I'm in the one place you can find me, you know, so you do, you do, you can get sucked into your own little world. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, I think you, you should have, although I only found out the other day, I don't know if people at home know this, but you know, that saying the jack of all trades, master of none of none is actually the full phrase is jack of all trades, master of none, 
is often better than master of one or something like that which i which apparently so i found that out yesterday and i was like <laughs> mind blowing <laughs> <laughs> changes the whole meaning of it <laughs> yeah, it yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Shall I tell you a bit about the 100% liner? That sounds like a plan. Yeah. So, so in some ways, is we should have tasted this first <laughs> in many ways, um, because this is is the kind of range of whiskies which really got Kilhome and started in the first place. Um, my father wanted to to build a, a new distillery which kind of echoed how whiskey was made when it it kind of first was created in some ways or first but prior to it being commercialized in some ways. And I don't mean that in a negative way at all. Um, but what he wanted to do was build a farm distillery where we grew the barley, we malted it, we distilled it, matured it and bottled it, uh, you know, all on site. And um, when he first built Kilhome and, you know, this, this whiskey formed well over half, half of our total production, you know, the half of our total production was made from barley we grew. However, kind of since then, we've grown much bigger than he ever kind of imagined we would. And, and the farm is limited in terms of how much barley we can grow. So this is, has gradually sort of decreased in terms of the overall proportion of, of whiskey that we make. But this is really where, where the, uh, the soul of Kilhoman is. And, and um, every year we grow about 200, 200 tonnes of barley. Um, typically in, in any year, we, we grow two varieties. Um, and recently we, we then harvest and distill those, those barley varieties individually and uh, they go full, through the full, full process, um, you know, to create single varieties, single malt. Um, and a lot of the experimentation that we do in terms of barley variety, yeast variety, distillation processes and such are really done with, with this um, barley that we're growing ourselves. So this is kind of the, the heart of Kilhoman. In some ways, it's, it's actually slightly counterintuitive because it's less peaty. So it's called 100% Isla, but it's actually only peated to, to 20 ppm compared to the rest of the range, which is 50 ppm. And immediately, if you just nose it, you get huge, sweet, perfumed um, mm. citrus notes um, on it. And that, that's really what... Um, is the unique kind of flavor profile with, with the 100% Isla. There's almost no peat smoke on the nose. It will come through on the palate, but on the nose, very, very light, floral, fresh. And um, this is, as I said, this is one batch for, from this year. So this is the 10th edition. We release about 12,000 bottles every year of this. Um, and this is a combination, I think it was 39 bourbon barrels and oh gosh i'm just going to check how many sherry casks it was two yeah 39 bourbon barrels two oloroso sherry casks so um mainly mainly bourbon barrel matured hence the kind of lightness of the spirit the caramel the vanilla butterscotch flavors that are coming through and then we just add a little bit of sherry my dad's quite keen on on bourbon and a, a little bit of sherry because he feels it just adds a, another layer of flavor to that, that kind of bourbon prof profile. So you'll see it a lot with Kilhoman. But this is, yeah, slightly higher strength. That's why I tasted it last. So this is 50 ABV. Um, and this is, I, I mentioned the two varieties. So this is um, Optic and, and Publican barley that we harvested in uh, 2007, 2009, and 2010. So it's a combination of different years, um, but it, it's a minimum of nine years, but it has, 11 and 12 year old whiskey in it as well. So that's a lot of information to digest. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's, it's really, really interesting. It's got lots of, as you say, floral, lots of lemon on the nose. It's, it's um, really interesting. It's, it, the finish is gorgeous. I find, as you says, your, your father with the small amount of sherry casks, it, it definitely can add to the finish, you know, even if you don't even notice it, even if it's drawing out those bourbon, those bourbon flavors, you definitely find that it, it lingers a bit more than some some complete bourbon maturations in my experience even if they're quite old the finish can fall off very fast you know yeah. um but it's no it's, it's very good sometimes if you get it just right it'll it'll add a little bit of richness a little bit of dryness but won't detract from the length of the finish mm -hmm. if you add a little bit too much suddenly it, it sort of cuts off the finish so mm -hmm. you, just, you you have to get it just try and get it just right um 
I talk like I'm I'm the one doing it, but it's it's nothing to do with me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we we do it a lot. You'll see it with um, with a lot of our our so small batches. So with any Kilhoman, you know, whiskey, we're vatting probably between forty and fifty barrels at a time, um, and what we constitute as a small batch is maybe five or ten. So particularly when we're doing those smaller releases, we'll pretty much always add just a little bit of sherry because we just feel that's, I don't know why, but we just feel that it, it just benefits, as you say, from just a little bit of sherry, just seems to draw out the flavors in, mm. in other, other parts of the vatting. And there's been quite a lot of talk recently, particularly, um, you know, an old Isla boy, Mark Rainier over <laughs> in Ireland, um, you know, with, with barley varieties and, and sort of terroir and whiskies. Mm. So, I mean, for us, you know, barley variety plays a part um, and we, we've just distilled, you know, our, our second barley variety um, that, we, that we grew last year. And, and there, there's clear differences off the still, um, clear differences. And we're, we mainly grow concerto barley, which is, we find it, it gives a nice balance between kind of rich earthy character as well as light floral citrus, uh, slightly malty character so we've grown laureate we've grown about 15 different varieties over the years some are very malty some are very floral some are very citrusy uh some are very creamy um and concerto for us is well firstly it performs very well in the field it can handle the the isla uh weather and then also it it distills very nicely for the style of spirit we're, we're looking to get but whenever you're talking about barley variety you have to talk about everything that comes after that Mm. so if you're talking about barley variety you have to talk about fermentation time you have to talk about yeast you have to talk about stills and and cut points and uh cast type um age all of these things you know they they play as much a part you know or have as much an influence on the whiskey as the barley variety so um it always you know it just has to be put in context in some ways no definitely no it's interesting and it's great i mean mark rainier doesn't seem doesn't seem to be a a Zoom tasting we have where his name doesn't come up at the moment. But um, but then, as, as I mentioned on our last week one, that I think it's fantastic that people are, are often argue here, and I'm not giving my opinion, I'm saying people often argue here over the merits of, of how much of an impact um, being able to trace the terroir actually makes on the final product. Um, but what I find is if he's, if he's making people talk about it and discuss it yeah. and, and have conversations, then that's a good thing. Um, particularly in Irish whiskey, where we've been, in the dark for so long and then in the 90s and in the early 2000s brands would say whatever they wanted on the label what was going on was was you know we were tiny we were two percent of the world whiskey market there was you know only three distilleries on the island um and clarity was was yeah. and transparency which is what you've mentioned a lot tonight was a million miles away from from the thing so if if mark is, is bringing that getting people to question the process getting people to question the tradition you know even the fact that he's dropped the e on the whiskey i'm actually a fan of that you know that's not irish whiskey wasn't always with an EY, you know, it's, it's a very modern phenomenon outside of, it's a Dublin phenomenon and outside of Dublin, even cork distillers kept, didn't have the E on the whiskey until like the 1950s. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging people's perceptions of, of the, of what Irish whiskey is. Uh, and those aren't necessarily, you know, valid perceptions. People have these ideas and it's something I've mentioned in chats that the big, because one company owned Irish whiskey throughout the seventies and eighties, they could set the narrative that of what Irish whiskey was, whether it was floral, whether it was delicate and triple distilled, you know, what they said was what Irish whiskey was, do you know? Whereas there is such a, a variety and tradition there. And we, that's not to say that that's not right. It, those, those have a place in it, those triple distilled whiskeys, but it is more complex than that, you know? So, sure. Rant over. <laughs> no, no, sure. Like, it's interesting because this is the first, this is literally, I, uh, my, my wife's family uh, are from Northern Ireland. So I sort of, I, they, they don't drink whiskey for a start. So, um, and this is the first kind of proper, uh zoom tasting or whatever tasting that i've had with with um with guys that are into irish whiskey so i was, I was sort of seeing getting your you know getting your thoughts on it is is intriguing it's nice it's good no. and it's great it's great to see i mean um the with the, the distributors we work with it's irish whiskey has just gone it, it went mental for a while i think mm. it's sort of it's uh it's maybe stabilized a little bit but um it's it's great I think it's, I think people often think um, that distillers think 
well, our, our view of it is the more the better, the more variety, the better. And as you say, the more talk, the better, because uh, we're very open and we produce in, in a way that is we feel is, is all about quality. So the more information, the better, you know. Um, but uh, yes, it's um, people sometimes feel that we are threatened by new distilleries and stuff like that, even on Isla. But I think the more smaller distilleries there are and the more they are talking about the, the detail of, of how their whiskey is made, the more that those smaller distilleries as a whole benefit from it. Mm. No, that's, no that's, that's very true. That's very, I mean, I, I know that there's a, dis, a fellow who's opening a distillery near where, where our bar is and there's three distilleries at a very similar time are seeking planning permission there. So it's still growing Irish whiskey. Um, and I was, we were saying, someone said, oh, well, how do you feel about having, you know, you had this plan obviously for a while thinking about making your own distillery and suddenly two more are on the same street basically. And he says, uh, you know, I said, are they competitors? He says, no, I'm looking forward to working with them. I think it's going to be fantastic because whether they are 100 meters down the road or whether they are 100 miles up the road, we're still going to be competing over a share in the market. It may as well be next door, do you know? And then at least we can we can have a, a cordial relationship rather than being some distillery the next county over, you know? And I thought that was a very good. And, and you know, ch- time to what you reminded me of what you were saying there. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Good. Even on Isla, you know, people... We're, I mean, we're at a community of 3,000 people on Isla. You know, we've, uh, there are nine distilleries now planning, planning in place for another two. Um, and um, those new distilleries, if when they come into existence, you know, will only add to the, the cult of Isla, you know. No, 100%. Have you got to Isla much now since the COVID restrictions have come in? or I sneak in. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, um, I mean, I normally I'd be back there probably once a month. Um, I would, I'd be over there all the time, but uh, my wife is, isn't so convinced by island life. Um, <laughs> so, so I have to, have to restrict it to kind of work trips, but uh, no, it's, it's a great place to be. The distillery is a great place to be. We've got a lot of, um, a lot of the time when you go to, to distilleries in particularly in Scotland, you know, you'll walk in there and you'll be shown around. You don't see anyone. I find it the weirdest thing because you'll show around this distillery, huge stills, huge piece of equipment, and you won't see a soul in, in sight. Uh, if you come to Kilhoman, you know, we've got 35, uh, almost 40 people there now. And because we've got farming, we've got a uh, visitor center, we've got malting, we've distilling, um, you know, bottling, all of these things. We've, we've got a lot of bodies and lots of people doing things and all the doors are open. You can walk in wherever you like. And it, it's it's a nice place to be. Lots of young people as well, because for a long time Isla really suffered from the exodus of young people but these days with the resurgence of of distilleries and and visitors coming to Isla there's a lot of jobs for young people so it's um it's a great place to be and if you haven't been to Isla you should it's not too far drive up to the north get a get a you can get a rib over the Ballycastle from Ballycastle it'll only take you um about 30 minutes 40 minutes and I, well, I nearly had an, an opportunity to go to the to the fesh island this year. Um, I was in talks with someone about there was someone who had already booked a trip who was potentially dropping out, and it had wasn't confirmed, but it was up and possibly on the. And then obviously COVID happened, so that all that all disappeared. Um, we have a question here from Nora saying, um, "Is your dad the master distiller, or is there another master distiller, or how does the the, the distilling team work there?" So we have a we have a production manager. Um, called Robin Bignall and he oversees everything in terms of uh, malting, distilling, um, filling casks and then my father takes everything from there so he is overseeing the maturation, selecting the casks for for the vatting so he's the the master distiller if you like. Um, Hasn't always been him, Um, we've had um, a couple of guys who in the early years uh, were kind of working with him um, or maybe he was working with them, perhaps, because my, my father's background isn't really in, in making whiskey. He has a, a short history in, in independent bottling, but he's really a wine guy uh, who came to whiskey when he married a, a Scottish lady and she persuaded him to move to Scotland. So uh, he, he's really in the, his history is really about you know, blending and, and, and bringing the whiskey together in the, in the bottle or in the glass. So um, Robin oversees all the distillation and and then Isla, um, we're, our general manager is called Isla Heads. He's, uh, he oversees everything in terms of, of farming and, and uh, all, of the, all of the other stuff that makes th- make things happen. All of the endless details. Mm. 
No, fantastic. Um, we've got a few comments in there saying the Sanig uh, is the best one. Um, although David says the, the Fino. Um, so that's interesting. Um, nine distilleries for 3,000 people. He says, I like the odds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Everyone knows. So on Isla, I think there's about 50 million bottles approximately that are produced on Isla every, every year. So it's, it's incredible. Um, no, that's fantastic. We have some very kind words from Bob there earlier on. So thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, um, no, it's it's fantastic. Um, any more questions, guys, or or have you anything you wanted to say, James? I suppose we've been we've been going nearly just over an hour now, so it might be perfect yeah. time to to come to an end. But I'd love to see if anyone has any last minute comments or if you've any anything. No, it's it's, it's been um, very enjoyable, and I, I look forward to coming down down south from you know escaping my in-laws at some point and coming down to, to see you guys down there Dude, please, meaning... we'll, we'll, look, we'll look after you yeah no i've been i've been meaning to do it for a long time so now i've got a proper excuse um i'll, I'll come and see you the next time i'm over for sure fantastic well i mean kilcoman is our number one whiskey in the bar we have we have a I, we have an incredible amount of i think we, we pretty much most releases we've got 15 or 20 bottles uh down there um which for for an irish whiskey bar with a you know for scotch is, is not bad so um, no, we, 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 are a fan of Kilcoman down in Clarny. So, um, and obviously all in Celtic whiskey in the shop in Dublin, um, we're, we're really big fans of it. So, so yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. So look, you, on a personal level, thank you so much for your time. Um, I know everyone's really busy in the comes to Christmas. So, um, for you to take time out this evening is, is much appreciated. Um, and thank you everyone for, for joining, um, the Zoom chat this evening. Um, these tastings, as I mentioned every week, you know, they were, something we used to do in the bar um, and we had a small dedicated crew of about 25 people who'd come to most of our tastings every month um, but to be able to bring them to this when we, when we when we talked about bringing them virtual we didn't imagine that they'd go to this scale and have people from America as 1 p.m California time was mentioned in the chat there a second ago you know so it's it's fantastic to to be able to 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 have that reach um, and for all the guys who, who return every week that's much appreciated as well so thank you so much James it's really really appreciated no problem at all. It's been a pleasure. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We'll see. We'll leave it there, folks. Thanks very much.